We are awakening together. This is our weekly gathering we hold online. For more information, visit our website, awakening-together.org. We'd love to see you there. So very nice to be here with you all. Welcome to our gathering. Um, (laughs) I'm going to read our um, statement of purpose at Awakening Together. We are an assembly of equals joined in common purpose, awakening to one true self within an appearance of many faiths, many cultures, and many symbols, we seek to discern one truth and to rest in its embrace. And then we are um, always prompted to read one of our um, five core values. There are five core values, and we usually kind of highlight one of those um, based upon what um, we believe our homily is going to be sharing. And I have chosen... I believe you. <clears throat> Core value number five, <clears throat> we accept all forms as temporary appearances permitted through enduring awareness of self. <clears throat> we live, <clears throat> need some water, hang on. <clears throat> we live this value by honoring all appearances and all experiences while continually reflecting on changeless truth. <clears throat> and then we're going to go to announcements. <clears throat> then. Um, all righty. So we are going to um, play our opening song this morning. And... Um, a little bit about the inspiration for this song comes from um, recovery literature, one of our books. And um, it's around the idea of the third step, which is uh, making a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. And um, it's a, about willingness. And this is um, the opening paragraph. It says, practicing step three is like opening a door, the opening of a door, which to all appearances is still closed and locked. All we need is a key and the decision to swing the door open. There is only one key, and it is called willingness. Once unlocked by willingness, the door opens almost of itself, and looking through it, we shall see a pathway beside which is an inscription. And it reads, this is the way to a faith that works. So my opening song today is from Keb Mo, and it is called The Door. And Sina, would you play that for us? I love the combination of blues plus uh, inspirational message all coming together. It's kind of interesting, so... I love the line in there. Thought I'd call up the hotline, but there was nobody there. And that is truly a blues, a blues kind of statement, right? So um, just a reminder that um, that whatever we're facing at any given time, um, that willingness can provide a key to the door to, um, you know, unlock any help or inspiration or guidance that we might need. And now we will have our reading. I <clears throat> apologize. I, I misquoted the book when I um, sent my description. And um, I think I said in the description that it was going to be from um, Pema Children's The Places That Scare You, but it's a different book. It's actually from the book, When Things Fall Apart, and it is all of chapter five, um, which is called um, Intimacy with Fear, is the name of the chapter. 
And um, my reader today is Joy, and I want to thank her very much for reading for us. So I'm going to invite her to the mic to read Intimacy with Fear from When Things Fall Apart by Emma Children. Thank you, Kelly. Intimacy with Fear. Fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. Embarking on the spiritual journey is like getting into a very small boat and setting out on the ocean to search for unknown lands. With wholehearted practice comes inspiration. But sooner or later, we will also encounter fear. For all we know, when we get to the horizon, we are going to drop off the edge of the world. Like all explorers, we are drawn to discover what's waiting out there without knowing yet if we even have the courage to face it. If we become interested in Buddhism and decide to find out what it has to offer, we'll soon discover that there are different slants on how we can proceed. With insight meditation, we begin practicing mindfulness, being fully present with all our activities and thoughts. With Zen practice, we hear teachings on emptiness and are challenged to connect with the open, unbounded clarity of mind. In Vajrayana teachings, or excuse me, the Vajrayana teachings introduce us to the notion of working with the energy of all situations, seeing whatever arises as inseparable from the awakened state. Any of these approaches might hook us and fuel our enthusiasm to explore further. But if we want to go beneath the surface and practice without hesitation, it is inevitable that at some point we will experience fear. Fear is a universal experience. Even the smallest insect feels it. We wade in the tidal pools and put our finger near the soft, open bodies of sea anemones, and they close up. Everything spontaneously does that. It's not a terrible thing that we feel fear when faced with the unknown. It is part of being alive, something we all share. We react against the possibility of loneliness, of death of not having anything to hold on to. Fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. If we commit ourselves to staying right where we are, then our experience becomes very vivid. Things become very clear when there is nowhere to escape. During a long retreat I had, what's, excuse me, during a long retreat, I had what seemed to me the earth-shaking revelation that we cannot be in the present and run our storylines at the same time. It sounds pretty obvious, I know, but when you discover something like this for yourself, it changes you. Impermanence becomes vivid in the present moment. So do compassion and wonder and courage. And so does fear. In fact, anyone who stands on the edge of the unknown, fully in the present, without reference points, experience, without reference points, experience, I'm sorry, I'm seeing this wrong. In fact, anyone who stands on the edge of the unknown, fully present, without reference point, experiences groundlessness. That's when our understanding goes deeper. When we find the present moment is a pretty vulnerable place and that this can be completely unnerving and completely tender at the same time. When we begin our exploration, we have all kinds of ideals and expectations. We are looking for answers that will satisfy a hunger we've felt for a very long time. But the last thing we want is a further introduction to the boogeyman, a 
Of course, people do try to warn us. I remember when I first received meditation instruction, the woman told me to use the technique and guidelines on how to practice and then said, but please don't go away from here thinking that meditation is a vacation from irritation. Somehow all the warnings in the world don't quite convince us. In fact, they draw us closer. What we're talking about is getting to know fear, becoming familiar with fear, looking it right in the eye, not as a way to solve problems, but as a complete undoing of old ways of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and thinking. The truth is that when we really begin to do this, we're going to be continually humbled. There's not going to be much room for the arrogance that holding on to ideals can bring. The arrogance that inevitably does arise is going to be continually shot down by our own courage to step forward a little further. The kinds of discoveries that are made through practice have nothing to do with believing in anything. They have much more to do with having the courage to die the courage to die continually. Instructions on mindfulness or emptiness or working with energy all point to the same thing. Being right on the spot nails us. It nails us right to the point of time and space that we are in. When we stop there and don't act out, don't repress, don't blame it on anyone else, and also don't blame it on ourselves. Then we meet with an open-ended question that has no conceptual answer. We also encounter our heart. As one student so eloquently put it, Buddha nature, cleverly disguised as fear, kicks our ass into being receptive. I once attended a lecture about a man's spiritual experiences in India in the 1960s. He said he was determined to get rid of his negative emotions. He struggled against anger and lust. He struggled against laziness and pride, but mostly he wanted to get rid of his fear. His meditation teacher kept telling him to stop struggling, but he took that as just another way of explaining how to overcome his obstacles. Finally, the teacher sent him off to meditate in a tiny hut in the foothills. He shut the door and settled down to practice. And when it got dark, he lit three small candles. Around midnight, he heard a noise in the corner of the room. And in the darkness, he saw a very large snake. It looked to him like a king cobra. It was right in front of him, swaying. All night, he stayed totally alert keeping his eyes on the snake. He was so afraid that he couldn't move. There was just the snake and himself and fear. Just before dawn, the last candle went out and he began to cry. He cried not in despair, but from tenderness. He felt the longing of all the animals and people in the world. He knew their alienation and their struggle all his meditation had been nothing but further separation and struggle. He accepted, really accepted wholeheartedly that he was angry and jealous and that he resisted and struggled and that he was afraid. He accepted he was also precious beyond measure, wise and foolish, rich and poor, and totally unfathomable. He felt so much gratitude that in the total darkness, he stood up, walked toward the snake and bowed. Then he fell sound asleep on the floor. When he awoke, the snake was gone. He never knew if it was his imagination or if it had really been there, and it didn't seem to matter. As he put it at the end of the lecture, that much intimacy with fear caused his his dramas to collapse, and the world around him finally got through. 
No one ever tells us to stop running away from fear. We are very rarely told to move closer just to be there, to become familiar with fear. I once asked the Zen master, Koban Chino Roshi, how he related with fear. And he said, I agree, I agree. <laughs> but the advice we usually get is to sweeten it up, smooth it over, take a pill or distract ourselves. But by all means, make it go away. We don't need that kind of encouragement because dissociating from fear is what we do naturally. We habitually spin off and freak out when there's even the merest hint of fear. We feel it coming and we check out. It's good to know that we do that, not as a way to beat ourselves up, but as a way to develop unconditional compassion. The most heartbreaking thing of all is how we cheat ourselves of the present moment. Sometimes, however, we are cornered. Everything falls apart and we run out of options for escape. At times like that, the most profound spiritual truths seem pretty straightforward and ordinary. There's nowhere to hide. We see it as well as anyone else, better than anyone else. Sooner or later, we understand that although we can't make the fear look pretty, it will nevertheless introduce us to all the teaching we've ever heard or read. So the next time you encounter fear, consider yourself lucky. This is where the courage comes in. Usually we think that brave people have no fear. The truth is that they are intimate with fear. When I was first married, my husband said I was one of the bravest people he knew. When I asked him why, he said, because I was a complete coward, but went ahead and did things anyhow. The trick is to keep exploring and not bail out, even when we find out that something is not what we thought. That's what we're going to discover again and again and again. Nothing is what we thought. I can say that with great confidence. Emptiness is not what we thought. Neither is mindfulness or fear. Compassion is not what we thought. Love, Buddha nature, courage. These are all code words for things we don't know in our minds, but any of us could experience them. These are words that point to what life really is when we let things fall apart and let ourselves be nailed to the present moment. Thank you so much, Joy. Beautiful. Beautiful, calm reading. It's always like just, it's such a comfort to me. Um, you know, I think we all develop our, <clears throat> our go-tos um, when we're really needing um, some comfort. And these books have always been that for me. So, and um, I was grateful to, to have this reading. So um, I can already see that I forgot to pray. I forgot to bring us in with a little prayer after our song. So we're going to take a couple beats and do that now. If you would join me, we're going to take a couple deep breaths because I am on the spot right now. And I, I'm feeling that there's much emotion here. Much, much, uh, much energy moving. I am um, so grateful to be here. And I just need to rest here. So please join me. Dear Father, I thank you so much for this time together. For community. For this community for these companions. I ask that you be with us, that you be words spoken, that you be words heard, 
that everyone receives what they need to help them on their journey. May the door of willingness be wide open for us to take a look. May clarity dawn where it's needed and stories let go when no longer helpful. Thy will be done. Amen. All right. Um, so I got a, a few things um, to share. Um, and I think a little introduction into the last couple of weeks that I've, I've had is, is helpful. Um, I, uh, regardless, I mean, there's a, a, there's a story playing out and it really, I got triggered, um, in a way that had not been triggered in quite some time. So it has, um, Ever since that happened, I had a I had an employee come to me a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm in HR. I had an employee come to me a couple weeks ago and report a sexual assault against her manager, and it and it was violent. And it's my job to receive that, and um, so I had to take that that she is um, a refugee. Um, so it was a, a challenge. I had to, um, I, I took her initial statement, but then I had to make arrangements to um, get an interpreter because uh, the language barrier was too great. And so regardless, with the, with the taking of that statement, um, a circumstance, right? A circumstance was launched um, in my work life. Um, and then, of course, in my um, in in the work that I that I do as far as um, you know my spiritual world, and it it has been um, a challenge in that once that circumstance launched, there's these um, just side by side experiences, side by side scripts. Um, and um, and navigating that stuff, I've gone in and out of clarity. I have gone um, in and out of complete panic. I have I have understood from um, uh, the movie Forrest Gump. We watched it um, a little bit this weekend, and I understood after uh, his uh, experience in the army and or in Vietnam and his PTSD, why he started running. I mean, and, and that's exactly how it has felt for me. I just have wanted to run. I have had a, a direct experience of, you know, fight or flight or freeze. And um, that's what, you know, I've just been, you know, kind of working through. I'm grateful for tools and I am um, grateful for guidance because I have been able to be guided to um, some things that that are that are helping me, um, but it has been um, it's been a it's been a challenge. So, like I said, there's a lot of emotion, and um, you know, they, there could very well be tears, and um, we're just going to deal with that and breathe through it. And um, I find extreme comfort and safety with you, as I always have. So I am I am grateful for that. So one of the things that I, <laughs> that I stumbled upon, I was going through um, my journal and I went back to January 1st and I, I just thought that this was kind of interesting that um, on actually on January 1, I uh, made some an introduction to the year and um, a little note to myself about starting 500 days again. And so I just, I just wrote um, starting 500 days again. It, it just is no need to judge it harshly. I want community as much as I like to isolate. 
but I do not want to talk myself out of awakening together. And I had been going through some uh, process of doubt and, um, you know, questioning my, my own, um, questioning my own aspirations, I guess, my own um, desires around that. And um, I could find myself listening to, you know, voices that were kind of walking me, you know, trying to take me out, trying to take me away, um, trying to isolate me from um, community. And I, and in my, you know, experience with recovery, I had seen that happen in in that particular circle where um, people begin listening to the voices of isolation and doubt, and maybe I don't belong, and why am I doing this, and I'm never going to transcend all this crap, and um, they walk themselves right out. And um, I certainly have seen and witnessed um, some misery and suffering that has um, come about for those folks as a result of that decision. So um, I did not want, I did not want to do that. I did not want to talk myself out of awakening together. So I was just admitting that to myself. <clears throat> so I do not want to talk myself out of awakening together. So here we go. And, um, and I wrote some more stuff. And then I said, I am grateful that right now I do trust that there is some guidance available to me. And it knows exactly where I am. It knows exactly any progress made when I cannot see. And it knows where I am to grow. And then there was this, this line that kind of snuck in, and I don't think I even noticed it until I reviewed it this when I was going through all this, and it says, may this year I be willing to practice when the heat is on, not just when it's smooth sailing. And then I wrote an aspiration that says, may I come to an understanding of how healing comes about and so I can remember who I am and who God is, and may I remember the truth, and I want the peace of God. So when I went back and reviewed this recently, it, I was kind of guided and told that this part about may this year I be willing to practice when the heat is on, not just when it's smooth sailing, was actually my true aspiration for the coming year. <clears throat> there has been much repression in this one around fear. There's no doubt about that. And I can see today <clears throat> that experiences truly are given to us regardless of what our resistance tells us. They truly are gifts. There is no way to transcend anything that we have not seen. That does not make the looking any easier. but how grateful I am in this day to be willing to look when I can because that, you know, and I have had, um, you know, enough retreats and I have listened um, to beautiful teachers here <clears throat> that have given me just kind of what Pema shared in this um, chapter giving me um, a heads up of what's to come, right? And when we're listening to that stuff or when I'm listening to teachings like that, when I'm not in the, when I'm not in that situation, like say they're talking about fear, 
talking about the purification process, you know, Regina's beautiful teachings about allowing things to rise up or allowing these energies to come up. And when, when I've been listening to those and not experiencing that stuff myself, um, I don't think it's just intellectual knowledge. There is some intuition that goes, oh, yeah, that, that's true. Um, even if I hadn't had the direct experience that she has experienced, there's still some intuition there. Intellectual knowledge for me says, oh, yeah, I know that. I, oh, yeah, I get that. I understand that. Been there, done that. Um, but that intuition is like, yeah, I, there's something about that that's ringing. Um, but like this um, reading Pema shares um, here, she says, like all explorers, we are drawn to discover what's waiting out there, actually within here, um, without knowing yet if we have the courage to face it. So we're not, we don't really actually know what's coming down the pike. And people can share with us and, and warn us. And NTI, a lot of the beautiful readings in NTI are you know, Holy Spirit is saying, this is, this is coming. You know, you, you've asked for this and it's coming. Um, and it's, a, it's a love letter. It's not what you think it is, right? I mean, that's kind of what my, my basis of this was that things are not as they appear to be. And so when, when that event happens, when that circumstance comes up, and this is just the circumstance that I'm going through, but um, when that circumstance rises, um, it is it is the gift, right? And and it's it's hard in form. It's hard um, when you have roles to play and in, in the works in the workforce. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's hard to walk that line, right? I mean, because there there are stories. There are stories being told. There are um, lawyers now involved. There are investigators now involved. There are counselors now involved. Um, there is um, employment law to be considered. And so, you know, all these scripts are, you know, are things that I have to maneuver through as part of my job. <clears throat> And yet the underlying intuition is such that, you know, that's, you know, I can have all the teachings that there's something else going on here. This is not as it appears, um, yet it still can be a hard, hard to maneuver through it. Um, because, you know, it is, it is a story and I certainly understand that and I'm telling my own stories and they're telling their stories and we are trying to get to the most genuine interpretation in form that we can come to. Right. So regardless of, you know, that first, that first um, receiving of that um, story, it was <laughs> reminiscent to me of, I was given a memory as a child because it is that, it's that moment of impact when you get triggered, right? So I'm receiving information and then this trigger, it triggers the alarm, right? And the alarm says, there is danger. No one is safe. Um, and it, you can feel that experience of the, the doors slamming, the alarm sounding, the light going um, and you're just you're just in that moment of crisis and you know I've maybe gone through periods of that but I've never been in that state sustained for as long as I have been this time I mean there's very little reprieve um, I am at times able to rest rest my mind, rest the story. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's triggered, it's kicked, and the alarm is going all the time. <clears throat> so the memory that came to me, which I thought was pretty interesting, was as a, um, maybe a, I'm probably seven, 
seven years old. And um, we're at uh, Lucky Peak, um, which was a recreational swimming hole. And um, my brother and me and my stepfather and my mom um, just went to do some swimming. And my, my stepdad and my mother were sleeping on the, on the sand, sunbathing. And my brother and I were out in the water. My brother at one point said, oh, see that little current out there? Go go lay on that. Go float on that for a little bit. And I followed his instruction. And so before that, I was able to walk and feel the ground underneath me. And then I went and got on that and we went out a little bit. And all of a sudden, I could not feel the ground underneath me anymore. And um, so I was pretty sure I was dying and drowning, right? So I told, I told my brother, I can't, I can't feel, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on. And he's, he goes and hollers to my stepdad and my stepdad comes out to um, pull me back in. Right. So the panic that hit at that point in time, I mean, I'm flailing. I am, you know, so panicky. I am terrified that I'm dying and I'm crawling all over him. Thank God I didn't drown him. I mean, literally, if you've ever been in that situation, you like climb to the top, you get as high as you can. <laughs> and for me, that was on top of his head and actually pushing him down into the water, right? So this is the one that's tried to save me. And um, anyway, he, he gets me back to, to safety. The, the interesting part of the story that I remembered later was that... Um, I I had a life jacket on the whole time. I I was not drowning. I was above the water the whole time. Um, so as I look back now, I was I was safe. I was safe, and and my father, my stepfather, had me the whole time. My stepfather was bringing me to shore the whole time. Um, even though this thing was going on inside of me that said, I literally am dying. And um, it's interesting to me, even though I've heard it a thousand times, it's interesting to me that that, that experience can feel the exact same in a completely different situation, right? And so <clears throat> this work thing triggering all this no safety. Um, it triggers, um, you know, all the different stories that I've been able to see and that I am looking at and that I try and let go of is it's, it's all about the stories are all about right and wrong. It seems like they're, it really does. It does to me, even now, as I share this, it seems to me as they're good guys and bad guys in this situation. Um, it's hard for me to let go of those stories. It is, it is my, um, my movie showing me all of that hidden stuff that I still hang on to, that there, um, there, are, there are cruel people in the world, that there are um, evil people in the world, that there is harm, um, that we need to protect ourselves, that we need to defend ourselves. Um, and I think up until these moments and up until these last two weeks, um, I had whitewashed myself into believing that, oh, that's not that's not true because the spiritual teaching says it's not true, right? That, that um, I don't know what I'm trying to communicate here. It's, I can feel it. I just believe I, I think I have not been completely honest with the beliefs that are underneath there. Um, I think I have not been completely clear with myself about the judgments I hold of other people and therefore the judgments that I also hold 
of myself. So, um, you know, within this trigger, I am able to um, take a peek at um, my belief systems of being alone, of being separate, um, differences. There are um, a lot of differences in the players that I see. Um, there's a lot of not trusting um, particular individuals and not being trusted as I maneuver through this. And um, <clears throat> I'm reminded of one of the things that I <clears throat> was also reminded <clears throat> about um, when we start on any new journey, whether, you know, I, <clears throat> I consciously feel like I <clears throat> started this journey in 1988. That was my first quote, what I would call a spiritual experience, right? Where there was this inkling that there is something, there is something at play here um, that, that I am not aware of. And um, that it's a loving, it's a loving presence. That was my initial experience. And um, so I invited that experience and, and pretty much feel like I turned over um, the rest of my life to that, to that end. And that was in recovery. And there's a beautiful process of doing that. Um, and I feel like I had done that. <clears throat> and, and I was reminded of a, um, a part of something that <laughs> Marianne Williams and shared in a return to love, I think. And it said, sometimes people think that calling on God means inviting a force into our lives that will make everything rosy. The truth is, it means inviting everything into our lives that will force us to grow. And growth can be messy. The purpose of life is to grow into our perfection. Once we call on God, everything that could anger us is on its way, or anything that can terrify us is on its way. Anything that can, um, you know, make us feel unworthy, make us feel less than, all of that stuff has got to show up. I mean, that is, I, I see more than ever before that it has to be that way, that spiritual growth has to be that way, that spiritual growth is not the way I thought it was going to be. It's not going to play out the way I want it to be. Can I um, find safety in there? Yes, I can. But there is a good chance that I'm going to have to settle in and, you know, once again, be willing to. I, someone, I can't remember if it was Rhoda or Sina, was talking about um, uh, recently made a mention of rest, accept, and trust on steroids. And I think that that's exactly, exactly the gift that's been given me um, over the last couple of weeks um, when I can and to develop some gentleness, to develop some compassion with myself, to develop all those kinds of things that I, I am going to need to, to move forward. Right. That, um, yeah, I don't do it perfectly. Yeah. I, I meditation is not easy for me. Um, and I do buy into stories and I do um, give believing attention to these um, false energies that I, that I hope to someday transcend. Um, and if I have those inspirations, if that's what my true heart desires, then it has to be on its way. Because the place where we go into anger instead of love or into fear instead of love, this is back to the quote, is our wall. Any situation that pushes our buttons or sets off the alarms, closes the doors or any of that stuff 
is where we don't yet have the capacity to be unconditionally loving. It is the Holy Spirit's job to draw our attention to that and help us move beyond that point. So my hope today is that given the circumstance, that it be used for healing. That is all I desire. And and even I can climb out of self-centeredness enough to know that that is not just my healing. Of course, that is the identified victim in this, her healing, the identified perpetrator, his healing, um, all the other drama around it, all the other fear and uncertainty about, um, you know, our company and, um, you know, the guilt because I'm the one who brought this guy in. I trusted him. You know, I, um, I laughed with him. So things are not as they appear. I trust that it will all be used for healing. And I think that is it. So I'm just going to reiterate on uh, Pema's reading. So the next time you encounter fear, consider yourself lucky. This is where courage comes in. Usually we think that brave people have no fear. The truth is that they are intimate with fear. When I was first married, my husband said I was one of the bravest people he knew. When I asked him why, he said, because I have, I was a complete coward, but went ahead and did things anyhow. So that is my experience. Oh, and one other quote that I pulled of another Pema reading that was helpful. As a species, we should never underestimate our low tolerance for discomfort. To be encouraged to stay with our vulnerability is news that we can use. Sitting meditation is our support for learning how to do this. Sitting meditation, also known as mindfulness, is the foundation of bodhicitta training. It's the natural seat, the home ground of the warrior bodhisattva. That's where we're headed. All right. Thank you. We're going to go to our mid song um, and this is also the time to um, donate to awakening together if you feel called to do that sign will post a uh, a link in there where you can do that okay ah, thank you <clears throat> thank you Sina thank you all for your uh, your beautiful comments um, we have just a little bit of time. If anybody wanted to share, certainly um, welcome to come to the mic. If not, we can, there's probably just enough time for our closing song if we need to play that and move into fellowship. Would be great. Sharon, awesome. I had to tell you, <clears throat> I was so glad last week that I got a chance to talk to you, Kelly. I don't know everybody here, but you are an amazing teacher of God. Oh. Amazing. The honesty, the, the courage. I mean, this is not an easy path. And if somebody thinks it's easy, they're just lying to themselves. This is a tough path. You know, and my path started even when my, from the time I was an infant, I had a lot go on. And each one of us has a different atonement plan. But you did this with such grace, and you gave us so much courage, and you just are beautiful, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Sweet. Rhoda. Hello, my friends. 
Thank you. I want to say it was almost the first words out of your mouth. And I've just been listening to you share from that space ever since you said, and I'm going to find it in the chat because it just felt really alive for me. Um, There is no way to transcend anything we have not seen. And I just, I appreciate the way that you demonstrate it the way that you clarify the value of it and that reading just really, really spoke to the heart of, you know, the fear is to use the AA acronym, just false evidence appearing real. And you said it over and over again. I know that this is not what it appears to be. And I can just feel that it is part of every, I feel like it is part of every experience, every time fear is felt, there's an illusion that happens and attention goes there and truth just kind of gets covered over for a moment, but it just, it can never be hidden. And no matter how form shows, it feels Amazing to know that we can be with some of the most difficult things in life and still know truth and still trust the clarity. So thank you for your self-honesty and your integrity and your sharing. Just really appreciate it. Love you. Love you. Thank you. And I guess that concludes us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Been watching our online gathering. It happens weekly on Sundays at 10:15 a.m. Eastern Time. To join us live in the sanctuary, visit our website awakening-together.org. You'll want to click on Online Sanctuary in the main menu, and then in the drop-down menu, look for How to Enter the Sanctuary. Right there at the top of the page is a clickable link. We'd love to see you in the sanctuary and join with you in fellowship. Thank you again for watching. Also, please know that if you'd like to stay connected via the Awakening Together channel here on YouTube, you can subscribe and hit the bell for more notifications. We hope to see you in the sanctuary.